Welcome to the Automoto Film and Art Festival Storytellers Podcast. Today our guest is Harold Osmer. He's an award-winning author and researcher, Southern California historian, and most recently elected to the Board of Directors for the West Coast Stock Car Hall of Fame. When I think about racing in Southern California, obviously we've been around racetracks a long time, uh, Ascot Park is obviously one of the premier places for racing in, in all of Los Angeles, and it has such a great history. But the Ascot Park that we know of is not the one that was the beginning one. There was, there was a start to the Ascot name being used for racetracks very early on in Los Angeles history, correct? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Ascot Park in Gardena, of course, was world famous, as you mentioned. We had a lot of the top drivers, a lot of activity went on there, and that's one that a lot of us really remember. But it did. It started in 1904. Actually, there were, there were four tracks called Ascot in Los Angeles area. There, there you go. I mean, I know this is an old shot, but you can just make out that there are horses on the track here. And part of the reason that Ascot Park even got started was because gambling was outlawed in uh, Los Angeles city limits. And they were running thoroughbred horses at, ex, at an agricultural park, exposition park now. Um, and they outlawed it. And so they said, well, nobody wants to watch horses run in circles if you can't gamble on them. Right. I don't know why you'll watch cars go in circles when you can't gamble on them, but it's a different game. So the guys who did that, they went ahead and opened up their own racetrack just outside the city limits, and they were trying to capitalize on the famous English course of Ascot Park, and so they that's right. what they called their place, Ascot Park. And, and this course is not where the current Ascot, or not the current, the, the Ascot that we know yeah, closed in 1990. 1990. 1990, yeah. so it's been, you know. Many years since that happened already. So, but the first one, where was this one located? It was at Slauson and Central, okay, which is just south of Los Angeles proper. Okay, and um, it later became a Goodyear tire plant. Interesting. Um, so it was it was around for that, not to be confused with the other tire plant, the Goodrich plant that was alongside the five freeway. This was totally the, separate from that. It's easy to mix them up, no right. doubt about it. You know, we've we've got a lot of history here in Southern California. So this was a one-mile horse track. It was not a fairgrounds operation. This was a privately held company, a private entity. And so they ran horses out here, and they had a good time with it. But they also realized that automobiles were coming on the scene, and people would have come out to race at Santa Monica and other places would bring their cars out to the track to just test them out mm -hmm. because they needed a controlled location where they could do this. And, of course, if you're going to get one guy out there testing his car, why don't we get another guy out here to test his car? And since we're going to get a couple of guys out here and word gets around, we should start selling tickets to some of this. And right. it didn't hold what you'd call regular events. It like wasn't, wasn't a race, yeah. so, so well, to speak. Okay. They had races and match races and these right. type of things, but it wasn't like, a, you know, you go to Ventura Raceway or even Ascot Park, they got the, the regular Saturday night show kind of thing. They didn't do that in here. It was all special event type of things. I see. But, and it and, was the same the right. same big names that it had came out from before. You know, Earl Cooper, Barney Oldfield, right. uh, Ralph De Palma, Terrible Teddy Tetzlaff, all those same guys and yeah. those same cars because it was that time period. The the track was there from nineteen oh four to nineteen nineteen. Nineteen oh four is just crazy i mean you're pretty much having a motorized horse horseless carriage at that point i mean right. it's really really well, crude well it started as it started as a horse track and so that's right. what they did it's just that they realized after a while that you know we can use this for more things and that's the, the trouble with any auto racing venue much like a drive-in theater you know it's busy on friday night busy on saturday night and the rest of the week sits there right and they had the same idea or the same thing going on but that's also, again, we can tie that over to, that's why Goodyear took over the plant and they could use it for testing. That same one mile course could right. be used for testing. That's what I was gonna ask, how big was the track? I mean, it was yeah. a horse track, so. And one mile was the standard for fairground which, courses back in the day. Which is good size. Yeah. I mean, if you go to a one mile, I mean, I went to a one mile sprint car race in Indianapolis and it just, it's massive. That is a big, big track, so. yeah. So you get and, some decent speed up there. Oh, yeah. And Maybe not in 1904. 
No, not 1904, <laughs> but by 1919, they were going over a mile a minute, you know, which oh, would be 60 miles an hour over the, over the one mile course. For an average, right. And it was mostly dirt. In the last couple of years, they went out and I haven't seen any real pictures of it, but I've seen plenty of, of um, articles on it that said they, they concreted the path. And so that took care of the dust and mm-hmm. that issue. And they were able to add a little bit of banking to it, which was, which would be helpful. Right. But the crowds were huge. You can see, you know, this particular shot, they, they're all across the infield as well as uh, in the grandstands. And that's Eddie pulling out front of, uh, of Earl Cooper there in the, in the eight. And these were the cars that were also running in Indianapolis, correct? Same cars, same, same drivers. Cars. Same car, same driver. Yeah. And Impressive. in 1913, the guy in the number eight car there... Earl Cooper won Jesus. the Santa Monica yeah. Road Race. Oh, really? The following year, the guy in the far the guy in the four car, uh-huh. Eddie Pullen, won the Santa Monica Race. There you go. So you know you got you got guys that it's quite the proving grounds. Uh, it was the top guys. Yeah. And they would hold match races, and people would come out just to see what was going on, depending on the weather and how much promotion and whatever else. You could get a lot of people, or you could get next to nothing out there. Right. And it just that's just the nature of the game. Another thing. I was saying, why did it close in, in, you said 1919? 1919. Horse racing was outlawed, so they had to stop running horses altogether. Oh, And it just got, the board track at Beverly Hills opened up in 1920, and so there were other things starting to happen to where, you know, the horse track needed to go away. Just just amazing, as as someone who has lived in Southern California for a number of years, to think that there was actually a board racetrack in Beverly Hills (laughs) is just mind-boggling that anybody would ever allow that but again we you know as we've learned racing was a good marketing tool for a lot of these folks so um, company or cities would actually embrace the racing at least for a period of time even palm springs did some of that to pull people sure. out there so and in, in a more modern time and, but and uh, things yeah. had to progress yes you know they, they started out doing one thing kind of morphed into something else and then they realized hey what if we tried right. this or that um, one of the promotions they ran at, at Ascot Park was was an all women's race, and it was it was a gimmick. Uh-huh. You know, they had some fun. They put the girls out there. Did they um, have cars? They did. Okay, they had cars, and <laughs> they ran on the big track. And the newspapers uh, yeah. called them speederettes. Speederettes. <laughs> okay. Speederettes. There's a there's a term you won't hear every day. No. Okay. And, uh, so this, this was at Ascot number one? This was at Ascot one. Okay. And Barney Oldfield's, or Mrs. Barney Oldfield, went and waved the flag to start the race and the whole bit. And For the speederettes? Yeah. Okay. It, it was a one-off. It right. was uh, kind of a fun promotional sort of thing, and it didn't go very far. Um, back then, it was, women could drive a, a car. Sure. Uh, to drive a race car over any particular length was just brutal. And it was just because of too the... much physical. Too, right. Too physical for them, and right. so they it didn't continue on. But it was a fun thing. It was just one of many promotions that they ran out. Do you remember who won? Ruth, Ruth. Waitman. Ruth Waitman. Okay, Ruth the Waitman. first uh, winning yeah. speederette. Very good. <laughs> speederette. There you go. Well, and again, marketing. Yeah, getting a yeah. drawing a drawing a crowd. That's very good. Sure. So so we have Ascot number one. Ascot number two happened. Why and where was it? Ascot two opened up. In 1924, in East L.A., it was at Valley and Soto Street, and um, El Sereno, they call the neighborhood now. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of folks would say it was in Alhambra, but it was on Alhambra Boulevard, you know, or close to Alhambra Boulevard. And so, you know, you could see that everything was really close there. Well, that's kind of downtown now, right? It is. It's essentially downtown. There was a, the zoo was right across the street from there, one of many zoos that came and went, um, Lincoln Park, and... uh, but it was at Valley and Soto, five eighths mile oval, and it was just carved into the hillside, mm-hmm. and it floundered for a year or two until the local Legionnaires took it over. Legionnaires, I think it was one twenty four uh, group took it over, and you need that sort of organization. You know, it's easy to say we're just gonna let's open up a racetrack. You know, sure. Well, you need organization. You need rules. You need somebody to to dictate when the gates open, when the gates close, what kind of concessions are we gonna do? All this organization that requires business sense. Sure. You know, you need some passion for the game, whatever it happens to be. If you're doing soccer or baseball, football, anything, you you got to understand the game and the type of crowd you're going to draw. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but you also need that business sense. You got to separate yourself from that passion and be able to know the ones and zeros of the game. How often did they race? They ran weekly shows. They did. Okay. And they ran what what they'd call big cars at the time. It was in the auto racing transition. The board track speedways were coming into play in 1920, so they'd been around for a number of years, and those cars started to target more towards Indy. Uh, the smaller racetracks were becoming popular because you could get a local crowd. You didn't have to travel as far. You could see the same guys over and over again. It didn't cost you thousands and thousands of dollars to right. put together your own car and go out there and race. What would it cost to go to a race like that? It would cost about 50 cents. 50 cents. Okay. And they were, and obviously it's dirt. Yes. It's not concrete. Right. It okay. was uh, just a clay oval and they would oil it. It was uh -huh. five eighths. And a couple of times, twice, they ran a Gold Cup race where they used the surrounding hillsides where Wilson High School is now. And they ran the AAA Roadsters. And he went out and ran around the hillsides and <laughs> called it the Ascot Gold Cup race. And wow. 250 miles worth. Oh, it was great. Frank Lockhart, land speed guy. Yeah. Won the first 250-mile Ascot Gold Cup race in 1924. Wow. Guys like Kelly Patillo, Ted Horn, Cannonball Baker was out here. Uh, good, and, uh, good. Good name, good. And, uh, he's well known. They yeah. had a they had a good time with it. Yeah, you know. Uh, How fast were they going on this track? On this track, on the on the road course, they're they're lapping about sixty miles an hour. The oh, better cars go. or the preferred cars were Ford Roadsters. Okay, and it wasn't that they were faster. What year are we talking? What year are we talking? Nineteen twenty four. Twenty four. Okay. The reason that Ford cars were preferred is that they had more robust steering gear. So okay. you got this rough course, you're, you're driving on the dirt anyway, and right. now you're going up and down and left and right, right over the bridge and through the, yeah. who knows. A lot of steering input. You right. need, and you need your car to, to hold together. You yep. know, you could break the proverbial $12 part and you're out of the race. Right. And uh, for whatever reason, the Ford's held up better just suspension wise. You didn't have to be the fastest. You still need to finish. So what type of cars you said, Ford, you said Chevys? Mm -hmm. okay. Ford, Chevys, Buicks, you know, just your standard stock what? cars. Okay. And that's what ran the road races. Right. And these were the same guys that ran at Mines Field, and the, they were colloquially known as the uh, AAA Roadsters, um, which just meant stripped down stock cars. There were right. some things you could do to them, but most of it was just right. Yeah, but you can see, you know, strip them down and run them. That's it. Lightweight. Yeah. Less. Uh, yeah. You know, and it worked out well. And now, Legion Ascot. Trim. Yeah, and Legion Ascot was open through the Depression. And so there was a lot of nothing to do. There was a lot of, we can't do much anyway. We can't afford to go places. We can't do things. So this became the racetrack or the local place where people could go and, and congregate and hang out and have a little bit of fun. And so that was, that was the big draw. And right. any small oval track is like that, though. You get the local guys. And, uh, right. But if you were a privateer, you could bring your, bring your you car out there it. and put mm -hmm. it up there. Okay. And there were still plenty of guys that came from here that went to run at Indianapolis. In fact, Wilbur Shaw wound up owning the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Right, right. And uh, a little side note on him is that uh, Shaw showed up in uh, 1932 and wore a helmet for the first time. And he was basically laughed off the track. I bet. You, you know, I bet. Sissy boy. What do you, you yeah. know, why are you even here? Who yeah. do you, you know? And he, but he tolerated it. And sure. he wore his hat, wore his helmet. Right. And a couple of weeks later, he got in an incident, whacked his head and survived. And it was just a couple of weeks later that uh, well, everybody was wearing one. And it was a couple of weeks after that where it was mandated that everybody has to wear one of sure. these helmets now. Makes sense. Because it was extremely dangerous. Open wheels, not much training. Right. In fact, zero training. Right. You know, if you got the nerve, go ahead and you go out there and you start driving. A lot of these were uh, Model Ts that just had a racing body put on them. So some of them weren't terribly fast, but mm -hmm. uh, you could modify them and do different things. They had the, the Rajo heads came out to where you could increase your horsepower, you know, almost double to what a stock Model T was putting out. Right. And then through the gearing and whatnot. And then you're running side by side. It becomes a matter of nerve. And then, you know. Pretty crazy. Yeah. A lot of guts was. here. A lot of guts here. Oh, Man. It's just amazing. And, uh, you know, it was a great show. Right. Because part of the allure is when are they going to crash? You know, you, of you, course. Know, you know they're running right on the edge, and the way you can prove that is when somebody goes over the edge and rolls over. Right. And, you know, you're, you're hoping they survive. Yeah, you They bet. don't always. 
No, I understand. I'm sure there was a lot of death associated with this. So they ran in 1924, you said, through the Depression. And what year did they, did Ascot II close up? Legion Ascot closed in 1936. 1936. And why, why was that? It pretty much ran its course. And the second thing happened was um, uh, William Randolph Hearst was kept attacking the racetrack or any death that would happen, any racing death. Even if it happened in Lower right. Slobivia, Georgia, they... Uh, Decided it happened at Legion Ascot, and so they would so, widow weeps right. over you know driver's grave. Why is the you know, why are we doing this? Blah blah right. blah, whatever else. But uh, you know they ran motorcycles and a whole, a whole bunch yeah. of other things there. It was very popular, multi-use yeah. facility. That had to be fascinating. Just those those bikes were really crude back then. That was pretty crazy in the twenties. But Hearst was obviously the newspaper guy. What what paper? Yeah. L.A. Um, Times. He, I'm not sure. Harold, he, yeah, I think he was, was a, he was a major Harold. newspaper yeah. guy, obviously, yeah. and um, yeah, so he was writing these articles and defaming uh, you know, pretty much anything he could do to sell to newspapers, you well, know, you which go. was all he was interested in was selling newspapers. He, I'm going to guess he didn't care if a race driver lived or died. I think he just was interested in selling a like newspaper. A, like a, the sensational nature of, <laughs> of news broadcasting today. Pretty much. Anyway, but uh, so it closed in, uh, you said 1936. 36. Okay, but fear not, there's yet another Ascot on its way. Which one was that? Number three came out where? Next one came out and was known as Southern Ascot. And it opened up in 1936 um, under a different name of Southern Speedway. Okay. And so, right there, uh, right. yep. And so Southern Speedway, Atlantic and Tweedy in Southgate, right up against the river. Mm -hmm. And what's what I think is fun about this one is whenever you see pictures of cars, that race cars on the infield or on the track and whatnot, they, after a while they kind of look like cars on a racetrack or wherever. But Southern Ascot, there was a uh, there's a train bridge that's still there today that goes over the river. And it's got the metal trestles and the whole bit. It's got that classic look to it. And you can see that in the background in a lot of the pictures. Makes it a lot of fun to just spot it there. Right. And Southgate, why? what was the uh, draw to being in Southgate? Just another open spot? Just another open spot. Okay. It was right alongside the river. And at the time, the uh, the river was not concrete yet. And so it was prone to flooding right there. And so then that was a bit of a pattern with Southern California um, auto racing venues was a uh, property owner would have this piece of land that he couldn't do anything with because he could expect every couple of years it's going to get flooded out. Mm -hmm. So whatever you build there is going to go away. So he'd lease it out to race car guys mm -hmm. and the rate, knowing that they're going to be there just for a short term. Right. And sooner or later, the land will be viable enough to where he can either sell it or develop it himself. Who was in charge of this particular facility? Who, who caused it to be and who, who ran it? There were a couple of different groups that came and went. Um, Auto racing in this particular period was huge. Midgets had just come on the scene in uh, 1935. Okay. And what was a midget? And, Give me that. Yeah, uh, midgets was stuff. Uh, we mentioned big cars. Big cars would be the guys that ran at Indy. Okay. Then you had a sprint car, which was a little bit smaller, a little less power. And then you had midgets, which were smaller than that and could run a really good show on a quarter mile track. And so they were running, you know, right. all up and all across Southern California. You could run Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, maybe take a day off and come back and right. run again if you wanted to at a different racetrack in Southern California at the time. It was economical to run these cars? Very much so. Okay. Yeah. That was one of the things that was also uh, cheap to buy. A lot of them, the, you know, the, especially the early cars here, ran off of Model T derivatives. And there were lots of those around. Right. That's a, a French version of the Blonde Comet. But uh, that movie's still out there. It's a lot of fun to, to spot it and I bet. watch. And what year was that? That was uh, 1935, I think. Okay. And, uh, oh, yeah, the woman wants to be a race car driver, and so she practiced by driving through the local hills and whatnot. And, of, and of course, nice. the... The real race car driver spots her and decides to chase her down and yeah. talk to her and give her the big talking to. Hey, you want to do that? You need to be on a racetrack, blah, 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 blah. There you go. Yeah, but it's great fun. Well, the, the midgets really reinvented racing in a lot of ways. It was particularly helpful in Southern California because you could run all the time and, like you say, races continuously and affordability. What kind of, I mean, did they run on gasoline? Yes. They yes, all they, ran on gasoline? They, they ran on gas. Okay. And um, who were the heroes of the midget racing? Oh, uh, there were just so many. Um, long list, long list, huh? The, the list is just too long. And if I yeah. start spouting them off, then we just okay. get stuck in that loop. But um, 
what made it great was the guys that raced midgets typically raced at Indy as well. And so you could see um, Kelly Patillo running a midget, and he's out there running it at, at Indianapolis at the same time. Sam Hanks running a midget, wins at Indy. Hmm. And there was a, there's a, a huge list of these guys, and, and we won't go down that hole. But right. so they have the big names, and if the and if you know the big guy is going to come and race at the track, you draw a crowd. Right. And you sell more tickets, and there you go. Uh, the local crowd is always going to get you know your 200 guys are going to show up to watch the local guys, but if you can get some big names in, that was always the way to go. How big were the crowds for this this race? For, this this. Yeah. Track pretty. I mean, obviously, Southern depending Ascot, on the day. Yeah, right? you'd, you'd get about twelve hundred to two thousand people at most. So and not huge compared most, to what most we're seeing. Small tracks were were small, but but <laughs> yeah. but continuous racing. There was a lot of racing. Right. All there right. was a lot of racing. There was a lot of racing going on all around Southern California at the and, time. And what were the competitive racetracks to this one? I mean, at that point, there were certain there were certainly tracks occurring. Correct. Atlantic Speedway, Gilmore Stadium was open. Gilmore, right? Um, right. Uh, Legion Ascot had closed just prior to this. Uh, Moto Speedway was open on in uh, Long Beach, and um, there were just so many starting to open up, mostly to take advantage of the midget craze. And um, they had a racetrack in San Diego down at where SeaWorld is today. It was Silvergate Speedway it was open the same time frame. Oakland was running. They were all over the place. Right. And Southern California, of course, was blessed with more auto racing tracks than any other place in the world. You know, just in terms of, you know, just sheer venue numbers, more racing has taken place here than anywhere else. And, uh, you know, so Southern Ascot had its role there as well. Makes sense. Makes sense. So that leads into the one that's near and dear, Ascot number four that we know, and that was in Gardena, correct? Technically, no. Really? You're going to think I'm strange here, but the Gardena Ascot Park is actually in the city of Los Angeles. Okay. Vermont Avenue... Runs along in front of where Ascot Park was. Right? Okay. You cross the street, you're in Gardena. So their mailbox was a Gardena mailbox. Their <laughs> Gardena mailing address was okay. there. And then the racetrack was physically in the city of Los in Angeles, of if Los you look at the city. And that's all part of the annexation, the shoestring addition for Los Angeles. When Los Angeles attached the harbor at San Pedro, this was part of it. Part of that so section. you look at the map, then it runs right along there, and it's so Unver it's technically right. in the city of Los Angeles, but we always say Gardena, right? And the reason we do that is because Los Angeles is so large. You know, if you're if you're in Northridge, right, you're in the middle of the San Fernando Valley. No, you're in Los Angeles. Well, dude, you're 35, 40 miles away from Gardena, right? You know, well, Ascot Park's. The, so that's how they quite did the it. technicality. I've just, never I've never heard that you, before. Just that's, to get that's, you close, that's, yeah. that's the best they could do with it, and and it makes sense. That's you know? that's pretty fascinating. And what what year did it open? 1957. Oh, okay. And it opened as Los Angeles Speedway. Really? Um, yeah. Okay. And it was it was built on uh, prior landfill property, and then it was again in the area that would flood out annually. And so they had some drama with that. And so it was marginal property. Mm -hmm. And they built the racetrack. And it developed over the years. Famously, uh, promoter J.C. Agajanian took over the place, or operation of the place. He never owned the property, but he did hold the lease on it. Interesting. And later, his sons operated it through Agajanian promotions. And they're still around doing their thing. Right. But they took it over in uh, 1958. And ever the promoter, he decided to call it uh, Ascot Park. Because he knew there was a lineage yeah. to Ascot, the name Ascot, right. throughout Southern California auto racing. There had been one since 1904. Right. And so we just decided, okay, that's what we're going to call the place now. Now that I've taken it over, we're going we're to change the name, which was common, too. A lot of racetracks, once management changed, they would change the name of the track. Just kind of how it went. Sure. And uh, so that's what they did here. So he took the legacy of that. Sure. Interesting. Well, that obviously would draw a certain audience because they were familiar with it. So how long was that track? It was a half mile. Half mile. They, they call it a uh, generous half, which yeah. means it was a little bit short. And to this day, there's no hard and fast rule as to how big is a given racetrack. You know, do you measure it at the inside pole or 10 feet up from the pole sure. or out at the outer fence? So you just get close. Right. You say, look, it's a half, it's a fifth, it's a quarter, it's whatever. This one was a half. 
They also made a quarter mile track on the inside of it. And, you know, you can see the quarter mile track up there along with the figure eight, which right. were very popular um, events. And this was the, this is uh, Vermont and, and uh, 190th here. Right, right. And you see the whole well. facility. Um, they catered, Ascot Park in Gardena catered to a lot of different motorsports tastes. They had the flat track motorcycles. They had motocross motorcycles. They had the the big bikes that would run out on the big track. Right. Uh, they ran dune buggies there. They ran really? midgets. Well, dune buggies came around in the 70s. And right. It was, and it was a big 60s. deal. 60s. Yeah. They were real popular. They kind of yeah. came and went. Right. And uh, But they could run on the motocross track and do the jumps and that sort of thing. Okay. And since it was a dirt infield, they could move a lot of the dirt around and reconfigure for whichever events they were going right. to run. Um, when they ran on the uh, quarter mile track on the inside, they would pit on the half mile track. When you're going to run on the half mile track, oh, we'll pit on the inside. And and as you hold these events and do these things, you can you learn how to direct the traffic, where to put your sure. rails, where to do your things, and it's right. it's just a matter of just logistics at that point. Right. Well, and, it's quite the complex. Oh yeah, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, so all the different things that they had to do there. And it ran from you said fifty seven to ninety nineteen ninety. So that's a, that's quite the legacy. Yeah, they um, they lost their lease um, or the lease expired, In and 90, um, really? and the property owner um, got sweet talked in essence to sell the property to a developer, which never happened. Um, it never developed into anything larger than the big truck lot at this is point. that what it is it's a wholesale truck lot at this point wow um so it, it could well have, have still been there i've spoken with um carrie Aganian and jc jr about why the track closed and all of these kind of things and that's essentially the story and i'm sure there are bits and pieces that you know none of us will ever be privy to but that's pretty much what it came down to was the woman just got sweet talked by a developer and okay and sold it off that way what kind of big races happened there they had Annually, they had big races. Did they not? Big sprint car and, and midget races? They did. It was nationally known more as a uh, sprint car track. Right. And so they ran a lot of those races, a lot of a lot of races that way. And sprint cars were big in the 80s anyway. But they also had the uh, Turkey Night Grand Prix would run there, which was a midget race, a traditional midget race. Right. And uh, World of Outlaws would come out and run there, which were the wing sprint cars. And by the way, you've got sprint cars and wing sprint cars. There's no such thing as a non-wing sprint car, all right? Just so we're clear on that. Okay. Because right. I love the world of outlaws. Yeah. That, that and always a, is a great, a, great and time. And that's a wing sprint car. That is a wing sprint car. Yep. A lot of wings. <laughs> a lot of wings going on there. <laughs> Those are great to watch, especially if you're on the infield. You watch that one of the wings sprint cars go into a turn. You can watch them enter the turn and get pushed down on the left side. Right. Because the wind will catch them, and, and that's exactly what they're designed to do. I love the giant yeah. fin on the, on the oh, top. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is terrific. a great thing. Well, this gentleman's having a challenge here, too. So with regards to the events and, and the development, I mean, you know, they're changing the, the catch fences and all kinds of things to try and make them uh, safer for uh, audiences. Um who are the big racers at this track? I mean, I, we've seen some names come up on the screen. Yeah, Brun Schumann, Bubby Jones, Knopfinger, Brad Knopfinger, uh, and a lot of these guys have are generational. You know, they either have a brother or their dad, right. or somebody ran alongside of them. Here's uh, Al Unser, and so you you just drew from everywhere. Um, one of the advantages of having J.C. Agajanian Sr. as the promoter for the track was that, especially in the wintertime, when everybody else is doing nothing, since he was out in Indy doing the IndyCar thing, he could convince those guys to come out here. Now, Parnelli Jones was from here, so he ran at Indy a lot. Or mm -hmm. at, at, well, not only Indy, but Ascot Park a lot, as did his sons. And so, well, Parnelli's going to be there. I could beat Parnelli, man. Come on, right. I'll, I got, I'll welcome any chance to go out and race with Parnelli Jones, sure. You know, and so you would draw those guys. Mario Andretti raced here. Uh, Jeff Gordon raced turkey night out here and then he probably ran a sprint car out here as well sure. and, I don't, and i don't know for certain but uh they were all out here all the big names and part of it was the racetrack part of it was the competition the sport itself and the other part was just the attraction of jc agajanian senior right because he he had that well he was the ultimate promoter yeah, yeah and i don't know if you'd call it clout but he just the folks just loved him. Right. They knew who he was. 
He knew what he was doing, and he treated the guys right. And so they would come out and do that. Um, and when I first moved to Los Angeles, um, I came up from San Diego, and it was mid-'80s, and I was at work one day and asked this nice girl. I said, hey, you know, you, you can go to the racetracks around here somewhere. And she said, yeah, and she took me out to Ascot Park. And it was good fun. We'd watch the stock cars, and they'd do the figure eights. Okay, we got to know a few of the drivers, and it was good right. fun. And then one Saturday, we were helping a friend move, and literally move his one apartment to another. He was in Redondo Beach, and we came out Artesia Boulevard and uh, went by Ascot Park, and we saw all these people going into our racetrack on a Saturday night. We went over and asked him, what's running here tonight? And he said, sprint cars. And the hell's a sprint car? And he says, uh, you got to come in and see it for yourself, man. So we went home, got our jackets, came back, watched the sprint cars run. We never went back on a Sunday night after that. It was always sprint cars after that. Because all of a sudden, instead of running on a small track, they're running on the big track. These right. cars are making big noise. They're going really fast. They're side by side. We have a bigger crowd. This is great. We ne we never went back to watch stuck cars well, there after you go. that. And well, to this day, my daughter and I will go to the sprint car races up at Ventura Raceway. And they run methanol now, and they did back then as well. And when they go by, you get that little bit of exhaust burn in your yeah. eyes. And the daughter and I would just look at each other and just smile. Yeah. That's, that's part of what we're here for. Brings a tear to your eye. Auto racing is a sensory <laughs> experience. You know, one car sounds different from two. Absolutely. Sounds different from five. Yes. And when they're at speed or when they're at idle or when all these things that comes to play. And when they go by, the grandstands vibrate. So you can feel it in your bones. You can feel the impact in the air. Um, and there's all the drama on the track. Who's going to win? Who's right. not going to win? That guy's on the edge. He might go over the edge. We don't know. Right. And that's part of what draws us in. Well, the legacy of this track lives on today. I mean, was this the last last race, I'm going to presume, pretty close, 1990? Yep. So, that, was, that was turkey night for the last race. Well, I'll tell you, what, what the legacy that has left with Southern California is, is super strong. I mean, anybody who ever went there remembers it. And the people that talk about it, obviously pulling the, the younger folks, which probably drive them to Ventura, which is, I think, one of the closer ones, I guess, that or right. Paris, right? That but, and Paris. Yeah. But, um, yes, and there's not too much in the way of racing down here these days. But, uh, yeah, this track just had such a legacy and such a warm feeling when people talk about it in the, the racing history of the of the track. So sorry to see it go. Even though there were four, maybe there'll be a five. You think there'll be a five? I'm willing know. to develop one. I don't know where it would go, but you know, hey, but I, well, let's gather up our aluminum cans and we'll see how much That's we can right. get. We'll and, just pull it up, but uh, <laughs> we'll go ahead and open yeah. one up. But this uh, this has been fascinating. Uh, is there anything else that I missed in terms of the legacy we were talking about? But uh, um, well, pretty, pretty interesting in terms of. Ascot itself, Ascot, the name, you know, the first one started in 1904. And it's just, it's continued on. It's just one more way of marking our time through history. The automobile, the development of Los Angeles, the location of these tracks as they've shown up along the way, the way some of them, well, two of them actually, uh, the first and the last, were tied directly to the shoestring edition of annexation of various parts for the city of Los Angeles. Um, all of these things are intertwined. And, you know, is it real important in the larger scheme of things? Maybe not. But it sure makes a great story. Wow. And it's part of where we live. And I think it's always better to know about where you live. And that's part of it. That's something that ties all the way back to 1904. And it was just this one little entertainment activity that, that just endured. Right. Well, I think that's the, an unbelievable legacy, and I think that was a nice way to tie it off. But thank you very much. I think that was excellent. This concludes another episode of Automoto Art and Film Festival's Storyteller Podcast.